I'm Paul North. I'm a professor in the German department at Yale, and I'm not a TV personality or a producer. So we're just technologically and in terms of this medium flying by the seats of our pants, our collective pants. So you'll forgive us if it isn't perfect. These are the Frankie Lectures in the Humanities at the Whitney Humanities Center. This series is called The Value of Marx's Capital. You'll get a little bit of a um, play on words there. The series is a companion to an undergraduate seminar at Yale, which is on Marx's Capital Volume 1. And it also is in conjunction with a new English translation of Capital Volume 1 done by my colleague and collaborator on this, Paul Ryder from OSU, who's here. I'm co-editing it, but Paul is doing a really sparkling, crisp, and rigorous translation which will be out with Princeton University Press in a couple of years. So we're taking the opportunity to work through the book with students and bring in uh, luminaries to go through it with us. I have to give a couple of thanks. First, the Frankie lectures are made possible by the generosity of Richard and Barbara Frankie and are intended to present important topics in the humanities to a wide and general audience. I'd like to thank Alice Kaplan, the director of the Whitney Humanities Center, who was behind this project from the beginning and is taking the center in amazing directions. Sandra Malan Bowles, who coordinates it from the Whitney. Leanna Hirschfeld Croen, who did all of the organizing work. I thank her. And Audrey Leek, who is our technical whiz kid. Um, let me say a couple of things about how the workshop will run for all of you here and also for the students in the seminar. Professor Musta will give a presentation with some breaks in it where we'll have some conversations. After that, there'll be a Q&A, starting with the students in the seminar, just to give them uh, a chance to get their questions in. And then we'll open up the floor to questions from anybody who has them. Let me ask you though not to uh, post your questions until I give the signal. They will simply get lost in the chat. So we'll ask you to put them in the chat in the Q&A. I will give a signal first to the students in the seminar. They can ask their questions and then I'll open it up and we'll try to get to all of your questions in the chat. If you need to leave or you can't make another of these sessions that you're interested in, they're being recorded. They will show up on the Whitney Humanities Center website about two weeks after the workshop, we hope. Also, I want to say just doing all this business that if you want to register for subsequent workshops, you can only register the week before, so keep your eyes out for that. One important act today, I think maybe the most important, is to reassess our vocabulary of revolution. Marcello Musto has become the MC of this reassessment, the ringmaster, I think, of an enormous and enormously careful return to Marx's texts as sources for new understandings of vocabulary we think we understand. He's gonna talk about one of those words today. I want to start each of these with a quote from the author. Here's a quote from an article on communism by Marcello Musto, quote, the alternative to capitalist alienation was achievable only if the subaltern classes became aware of their condition as new slaves and embarked on a struggle to radically transform the world in which they were exploited. Their mobilization and active participation in this process could not stop, however, on the day after the conquest of power. It would have to continue in order to avert any drift towards the kind of state socialism that Marx always opposed with the utmost tenacity and conviction. A moment of Musto's prose. Now I'd like to turn the microphone over to my collaborator, Paul Ryder, who's a professor of German at Ohio State who will intro introduce Professor Musto. Thanks, Paul, and welcome, uh, Pro Professor Musto. It's such a pleasure to, to welcome you to our series. Uh, Marcello Musto is a professor of sociology at York University in Toronto. One of his most recent publications is entitled The Marx Revival, and interestingly subtitled, uh, New Concepts and Interpretations, or Key Concepts, excuse me, and Interpretations, and this speaks to what Paul was just saying about his, his interest in engaging very rigorously with particular categories um, today, rereading them, reassessing them. Um, 
and we see that in his work on, on alienation as well. Um, if you've read the article that was disseminated on alienation, you know that he writes with tremendous erudition and clarity, enviable really. Um, and uh, to come back to this, uh, this title that I just mentioned, The Marx Revival, uh, there is a Marx Revival and uh, Professor Musto is doing truly more than any other scholar I can think of to, to advance it. He's, in addition to the qualities that I just mentioned, he's incredibly prolific. He's given over 50 interviews in recent years, written over 50 newspaper articles, and also his uh, list of publications is much too long to, to go through in its entirety, but to, to mention just a, a few things, he's edited on anthologies on uh, Capital 150 years later. He has a massive anthology in the, in the works on, uh, or handbook uh, really on the global dissemination of capital and, and the history of, of translations of capital around the globe. He's also authored uh, many books as well. Most recently, uh, the, uh, or sing written many single authored books as well. Most recently, The Last Years of Karl Marx, which uh, just appeared in the spring, I believe, and uh, is really a, a marvel of, of compactness. It's a biography of Marx's last years archivally very rich, conceptually very interesting, uh, not, not very long either. Uh, really, it's a great deal for the reader. And I'd like to mention also that uh, it was written in Italian and came out in 2016, um, just around the time that the big wave of Marx biographies was starting to really take shape and, and come at us. Um, and it was translated very effectively, let's not forget the translator here, by Patrick Kammler into into English. Um, so uh, it's really wonderful to have Professor Musto here. The title of his presentation today is Marx's Conception of Alienation. Thanks for being here. Thanks everybody. Um, good afternoon, good evening to um, all the people who are listening now. I am uh, indeed very grateful for your invitation, for your generous words, very, very generous words. And um, I am very happy to be here with uh, Professor North and Professor Reiter. I will call you Paul and Paul, if I may, even this is the first time that we talk to each other. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm sure that we are going to talk about this later, but I was extremely happy when I heard this fantastic news that Capital was going to have a new translation in English at this time, very important, and uh, with such a prestigious um, publishing house like uh, Princeton. Um, we'll discuss this later, but it was um, wonderful to have this news and to put together these two um, interests for Marx, like, you know, the importance of reading Marx very carefully. My work has been uh, as uh, philological as possible, but at the same time trying to use what Marx right for understanding um, our societies, our issues. Um, it is also a very strange talk for me, um, and I will try to uh, make um, some jokes. It is the first time in my life that I talk not being standing, like just sitting at the table, because generally I used to uh, uh, stand, and I also used to speak as a young activist at the university in, in Naples and Italian. I was uh, in Italy until uh, uh, I had to leave and go to Berlin to study English, and then I moved here in Toronto in 2009. I would like to start from a couple of biographical notes, if my uh, host allow me to do this, because perhaps it's useful, it's interesting for the many students or researchers who are listening now. So we are in this uh, um, uh, period of uh, rediscovery uh, for Marx, and um, I will introduce a couple of topics that I hope I will be able to discuss with uh, Paul North and Paul Reiter, and then later with uh, more people. <clears throat> but when I started to read about Marx, um, I have uh, another image now. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, 
We hear you fine, Marcello. Yeah, no, there is somebody, uh, there was somebody um, who uh, turned the microphone on and they saw another face. Um, when I started to read Marx, so when I entered my PhD in 2002 in Italy, I um, was actually the first uh, researcher, the first person who was going to defend the dissertation after so many years in such a big and important country for Marxist study like Italy, a dissertation entirely on Marx. And um, later when I moved to Berlin, when I started to go there and I spent some time at the um, uh, Berlin Brandenburgische Akademie der Wissenschaften, which is the Institute for Social Science, where um, the new edition, the new critical edition of Marx and Engels writing has started in 1998, has restarted. I remember that my perception of Marx changed, changed dramatically. And one of the points that I would like to make today uh, about capital, later we will discuss about this, is that after the mega, uh, after this um, enterprise that I will present in a, in a minute, uh, looking at Capital like a book of three volumes, this classic set that i would seen many times in my life, um, and comparing these three volumes with the 15 volumes and this huge um, a critical apparatus, so every volume in the mega is uh, 500, 700, 800 pages of apparatus. So this is the second section of the mega, which is called capital in his preparatory manuscript is a big change. It's a big change for us, for readers of Marx. I will go back to this point um, uh, very soon. For the moment, I would like to discuss with you, I would like to discuss with uh, 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 Professor North, uh, Professor Reiter, Paul and Paul, I would like to put a couple of cards on the table. And the first question is, what kind of revival? Paul just said that there is a revival of interest for Marx. We know this revival mostly because of what happened after 2008. After 2008, one more big economic and financial crisis. And Marx is back in Europe, in North America, after 20 years of silence, practically. Um, so the Marx that we are reading is mostly a Marx that could be, you know, the critique of political economy, the critique of capitalism. And Marx was celebrated on many important newspapers, liberal, conservative, it doesn't matter, like the person who is still useful for us, you know, to understand capitalism, including publishing some wonderful articles that Marx wrote in 1857, 1858, at the time of another big financial crisis that started in New York 150 years before the crisis that erupted in 2008. I remember I was in Berlin buying the Frankfurter Allgemeiner and being so shocked of seeing two full pages of, you know, reprinting of the famous article on the economic crisis that Marx wrote for the New York, New York Tribune in 1857. But in other parts of the world, actually, there was another reading of Marx or another interest of Marx. For example, in Latin America, Marx was rediscovered a few years before the 2008 crisis. And the return to Marx was, I would say, more political than the one that we had in, uh, um, in Europe and in North America, with all the contradictions, with all the problems. But it was a Marx that uh, was alive and was perceived as something useful, no? something that people would need. And if you ask me after this uh, uh, many years of, uh, of work, of collective work, like trying to um, connect young researchers, um, institutions, universities, and you know, try to rediscover Marx. Uh, Paul North read uh, um, um, this um, uh, citation at the beginning. So it's clearly a Marx that is very different from the tradition of Marxist Leninism in the 20th century, etc. But if you ask me where I've seen the most interesting things in, in which country, I would say that Brazil is definitely the place that called my attention more than anywhere else. I remember, you, some people would be surprised because today 
Brazil is not the place where there is the most progressive government or at the moment there are not very strong social movements like in the past uh, couple of years. But um, the attention in the universities and in this research group that are not closed merely to the university, but they're open to look at the contradiction in our societies, the attention for Marx or for an author that I also very much like, Antonio Gramsci, but let's just stay to Marx today, is really impressive. I, I don't want to say give wrong numbers, etc., but I think that there are at least 150 centers of research around Marx and Marxist studies in Brazilian universities. And when I went there to meet some of these um, scholars, I was impressed by the fact that many of them were extremely young. So they, they belong to a generation that was actually younger than mine, and uh, they had new demands, they had new enthusiasm, they had new, new topics. And I want to return to this question of new topic because I believe that the Marx that is read now in the last two, three years, and um, Paul Reiter was very generous when he described my book, uh, The Last Years of Karl Marx, but my effort in the publication of the book was trying to rediscover a Marx that is very different from the perception that we have of this author, a perception of an author who has dedicated his entire life merely studying or fighting politically the contradiction between capital and labor. There is much, much more in Marx. And uh, I am very uh, happy to see that uh, a majority, I would say, of the books of the studies published in the last two, three years are opening topics that later were never or very rarely associated with Marx. For example, ecology, for example, uh, gender emancipation, for example, uh, migration, uh, nationalism, colonialism. Um, I believe that there is a lot of Marx that must be discovered, and I believe that the last part of uh, his life, the last 10, 15 years, from the international 1864, 1872, to the year that Marx died in 1883, there is a lot that will be done there. And this is the task of a new generation of scholars, of researchers, of translators, in particular of translator Paul Reiter, because there is very few of Marx that has been published in that period. And I hope that we can discuss this. I'm not lost in my thought, but I'm trying to follow um, what I promised. So this first uh, um, uh, group, I have prepared five, and the first one would be a sort of, you know, the Marx revival today in the world. So I would like to say that I discovered also other kind of revivals. For example, in China, uh, it is impressive the amounts of books that were translated in China in the past uh, 15, 20 years. Not only there is a new, very scholarly, rigorous, and serious edition of Marx and Engels writings, but this translating also for the first time from German and not from Russian, some writings of Marx that before had little circulation or full translation or very ideological reading. But in China, there has been also a big opening to uh, the so-called Western Marxism, or if you don't like this terminology, to many European and North American authors. So there is a new generation of Chinese students, in particular in humanities, a little bit in social science. And I would say my experience, not at all in the economics, so another paradox that is repeating now also in China, that is very interested in Marx and also in this new reading. So I've always seen uh, China as a place to compete, right? As a possibility to enter and also listening to what these scholars are doing, are saying. So I am the uh, co-editor of a series that is called Marx Engels Marxism New Dimension. And my most important effort in terms of editor is translating from Spanish, from Brazil, uh, uh, Portuguese, sorry, from Chinese, from Japanese, countries with a very strong and lively tradition 
in terms of Marxist studies, translate this thing into English. Because sometimes um, these uh, readings of Marx are different and I find very interesting to discuss these uh, uh, different options, these different ideas of Marx. Um, I stop here on this point, but if I have, please, uh, two more minutes, three more minutes, I would like to come back to the question of what kind of Marx is read today at university. I spend a lot of time looking at all the syllabi around the world, and unfortunately, I'm not going to share good news with you. This is at least my understanding of the situation and my opinion. I've seen that the Marx that today is read in many departments of politics, political science in the world is the Marx of, on the Jewish question, which is a, a very brilliant, actually, writing. Unfortunately, this writing, which is not called the Jewish question, but on the Jewish question, is a reply to an article written by Bruno Bauer called the Jewish question that was never translated into English. So, many times people do not understand what is the real polemic about, and then there is all the party in favor of Marx, the party against Marx. Marx is doing bad things, Marx is saying always the, the perfect and the right things. But this text, it is surely a text that is not representative. Allow me to do this provocation, but I'm sure that my discussion will understand. It is not representative of Marx's politics. If you want to read Marx, you have to read Marx at the time of the International. And why the text is not there? Because Marx at the time of the International is a very complicated, a complex mix of writings, documents, declarations, speeches that he did, with the exception of the civil war in France, is not easy to combine and have a clear idea of Marx's positions. If you look at sociology, in the Department of Sociology, a big majority of them, they read the German ideology. But today, the German ideology, you invited Terrell Carver last week, perhaps he mentioned this, I'm not um, uh, bothering, I'm not taking time with this, but today we know that the German ideology, we know more than before, is not a book, is not the ideological Bible for historical materialism that, uh, uh, Soviet Union, Adoraski created the head of the Institute for uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin in 1932, okay? So if we read the, the pages on the division of labor in the German ideology, we know that this is just the beginning of a very long journey and they cannot be compared with capital. But once again, capital is a complicated, thick book. And if you want to extract parts from there, it is, uh, a difficult uh, task. Marcello, Any, yes. Can I ask you Please. a couple of questions? Um, hmm. It looks like he is spotlighted, and I'm not showing up. I'm not sure this is a problem because we want to make sure that the people who ask questions are. Do you all see me when I'm speaking? Oh, I you do. Well, yeah. I just don't see myself. I wanted to. Well, first, I wanted to thank you for the. The picture of a kind of um, textual international, which we hope precedes the fifth or whatever international is coming, a political international. It really is encouraging for people who read these things to know how much is going on. Also for the picture of a reconfiguration of the corpus, which is an interesting phenomenon. And I think we all need to say where to start reading Marx, where to go next, what for, what um, pitfalls to, to ignore. I wanted to ask you though, in this world flowering of Marx studies and in the reconfiguration of the corpus, um, what role does alienation play in that? We're gonna talk about alienation today. Is it a hot button issue? Is everyone worried about alienation? Where should it fit in the new program? Thanks. And uh, when I talk too much, like when I pass the 12 minutes and more or less we are located for each block, I will be uh, very grateful if you or Paul Rater, you just um, stop me very politely as you did, but you helped me to move forward. 
surprisingly, I want to discuss, I want to answer briefly, shortly, and then I will expand this surprisingly. Even though um, alienation is a topic on which there were so many books written in the 60s, in the 70s. And uh, alienation was, um, I would say, uh, as relevant as the topic globalization has been for us in the in the past two decades, right? Really, everybody wrote about alienation. And uh, I can think in the 60s and in the 70s, in many disciplines, in sociology, in politics, in psychology, um, literature, uh, few terms at the fortune of, uh, of alienation. And uh, Marx alienation, Marx's conception of alienation, which is the title of my talk, my contribution today, was the most important uh, element uh, of uh, uh, analysis. Despite this, when you publish on alienation today, and when you put actually the word alienation in the title, I noticed that there is an incredible interest, even more than usual. And uh, there are many books, many articles published on alienation or on fetishism. So in this rediscovery of Marx, in this Marx revival, I see that there is a lot about alienation and about fetishism. And let's try to discuss together, please help me, I need your help, why this is possible. Um, I have an, an answer. I will try to provide um, um, my idea, my opinion, and then we'll see what you two believe and then there will be question criticism. So even though alienation for us is a, a classic in the Marxist thought, and uh, if we look at the topics, alienation is perhaps one of the top five topics, like Marx and alienation is as important as Marx and communism and Marx and critique of political economy, I want to say that this phenomenon is something very, very recent. And here I'm talking to the students who are listening. I will be a little bit uh, boring for those who are big Marx excerpt, experts, but uh, uh, I would like to spend a couple of minutes discussing this with students. I lost Paul North for the moment, but uh, he's back now. Okay, so why alienation is something new? Alienation is something new because the text, which is not a book, but it's a, a very, very first stage manuscript that Marx wrote for himself, the famous economical philosophical manuscript of 1844, which is to complete what I was saying before, the most important text in terms of philosophy. So what is read about Marx in the departments of philosophy and not only there, all over the world, one of the um, most sold book in philosophy in the 20th century. This text was written by Marx in 1844, but was actually published in 1932. And uh, the fortune of the concept of alienation is actually very much related to this text of Marx, because when this book was published in 1932, now everybody will say, oh, it was the beginning of alienation of the world. No, not at all. One year after Hitler uh, took you know, Germany and they were trying to burn Marx's manuscript and the manuscript of Marx were sent to London and then Denmark and then they ended the majority of them in Amsterdam in the beautiful Institute for um, International Institute for Social History. But before the end of World War II, so end of the 40s, second part of the 40s, beginning of the 50s, this text, the Economical Philosophical Manuscript of 1844, was uh, not known, was unknown, right? So the concept of alienation starts to have this important place in the tradition of Marxism only after the publication of this text. And also the question of fetishism, to go back to capital, because there is this famous uh, section that I will try to discuss later when we approach the fourth point of our conversation today, 
But if you look at the debate in the second international, in the third international, if you look at the books, articles written by Kowski, Lenin, Bernstein, Labriola, Sorel, they didn't write about alienation, about fetishism, even though fetishism was published and was there since 1867. Or actually Paul Reiter since 1872, because it only when Marx did that new German edition that fetishism appears in a better way. So I'm also asking a questions to my uh, discussant. So alienation has a relevant place today because it is still um, considered one of the main topics for Marx. This tradition started you know, in the early 50s, like 70 years ago. And I will say most importantly than this, because we never lived in such an alienated society like today. That's the most important answer for me, like a researcher that is not only close in this uh, uh, room office in the university. So I believe that Marx is relevant today. Of course, many of his analysis must be updated, must be changed. There were many mistakes, many limits, problems like every other thinkers. But capitalism today is so spread so much globally in every region of the world and is so present in every aspect of our life that I cannot think about, you know, another concept that um, is uh, uh, as uh, uh, relevant as this one, that can be used as this one. The question, and I stop here and I pass the microphone to you, the question is to understand what Marx really meant for uh, alienation, right? Because there are many different ideas, many different approaches. And I don't know if you want to go there now or if you want to wait a little bit more. So. Let's see what my discussion and host uh, think. Well, I think you do a, a very nice job of framing the, some, some of these questions. I mean, you, you did a nice job here, but also in the article that, that was circulated. And uh, there is a, a long running debate about the relationship between Marx's early views on, on alienation, alienation as it's framed in the uh, manuscripts that you were just talking about, and the way of talking about what is in effect alienation that Marx has in in Capital, and uh, I was excited. I, I read your article really just before uh, we we started uh, this event, and so I'm I'm actively still processing it. But uh, I was I was excited to to, to see how you frame the fetishism section of, of capital in the context of this discussion of alienation and this very artful genealogy of the different ways that alienation has been, uh, has been picked up on, uh, reworked um, in the various traditions of, of Marxist theorizing. I mean, I think that with, with uh, fetishism, um, the appeal of that section, I mean, it has multiple levels of appeal uh, one is that it's been influential in a certain kind of cultural theory that remains influential and people who come to Marx from that side of things or with those affinities will, will, will feel drawn to it. But I think that um, as capitalism expands, becomes more complex, uh, I think there's a, a, a more uh, pressing need or a more urgent desire to, to work through its mystifications. And this is as for me at least, uh, the most rhetorically powerful uh, attempt in capital to formulate the, the mystifications of capital, how capital as a system throws off false appearances and misleads people and the role that these mystifications play um, in, its, in its ability to, to dominate them. That was more a comment than like a question exactly, um, but... Uh, you know, I actually, uh, I like this very much because this is uh, um, um, completing uh, what I was trying to, to say before. And I have also prepared something that unless uh, you and Paul North disagree with me, um, soon I'm going to share the, the, the PowerPoint a little bit, uh, a little PowerPoint that I prepared so that the students who are following 
are not scared about this uh, you know big concept and definition that we provide but perhaps they can read so i have selected paul a couple of definitions from the article that you just mentioned and then we might want to go back on this uh, on this topic later but what you told me is very useful for me because uh, it helps me to move forward in uh, this discussion about uh, what kind of alienation are we reading so that conception of fetishism it was so powerful and it was already there from the very beginning but arrived as you said but arrives to the attention of um, uh, you know the, 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 the activists, not, not, not only scholars, but activists, um, only after there is this big um, interest that is at the beginning a philosophical interest, I would say, for, uh, for alienation. I don't know if Paul North disagrees with me. Let's see what, what he will say later. But um, in the 50s, in this tradition of French existentialism, for example, or uh, all this philosopher or all these readers uh, coming from different political and cultural traditions. Let's think, for example, about uh, Jesuits in, in France and uh, later also in, in Latin America with liberation theology, very significant uh, social movements and um, uh, political ideologies, a school of thoughts. I don't know how you want to define this. Um, they are actually making a choice. And the choice that they are making is that they are reading a particular Marx. And this Marx is the so-called young Marx, which I believe is one of the biggest inventions in the history of, uh, of Marxist studies. Again, another provocation for my, for my discussions. So, I never said Marx would have done this, Marx would have said that, Marx would have voted for this party, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that recently I allow myself to say, and believe me, it's the only one, is that I am strongly convinced that Marx will be shocked if he will see how much attention uh, uh, the humanity has given to this manuscript that he wrote when he was only 25, 26 years old. This beautiful, wonderful manuscript, I want to say that I wrote my dissertation on the Economical Philosophical Manuscript of 1844. I love them. I don't believe to them who say this is not Marx, okay? But we cannot uh, um, uh, overestimate the importance of, of this manuscript and do not study what just uh, Paul Reiter said, you know, fetishism in capital and also all the making of uh, uh, the concept of alienation and fetishism and reification, as I will show later by using the terminology of Lukács, that started in 1857 with the Grundrisse. I prepared something, so I don't want to intervene on this point now. But what I want to say is that, unfortunately, and I will use this uh, 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 word, in this big debate about alienation and about Marx, capital was lost in many countries and in many political translation. And there was a very significant portion, portion of readers or interpreters of Marx who decided that the economical manuscript of 1844 was the most relevant place. I believe that this is wrong because this was the idea that capital belonged to Soviet Union and that dogmatic econ econ economicistic reading of capital was the correct reading of capital. But I just want to say that capital was Marx's life because Marx wrote capital, wrote capital from 1857, from the introduction that he wrote in July of 57, exactly at the same time that the crisis started, that the crisis that I mentioned before in New York, because he said, Engels, I no longer have time to play. The revolution is coming now and I must have my book out. As always, he was wrong. The revolution didn't come, but at least this was a first push to have the first draft of Capital, the Grundrisse, you know, this uh, um, eight notebooks uh, that he wrote in only uh, um, six months. 
And then this draft for capital, they just ended in 1881, at the very end when Marx was extremely tired, extremely old. But I have no time to talk about this unless you don't ask me to do it. But I want to go back on this division, on this distinction between the early writings and capital. And this was around the concept of alienation. So the concept of alienation was the key concept in this division of schools of interpretation. Many people, they belong to different parties, different cultures, different traditions, different countries, different fields. They decided that the economical philosophical manuscript of 1844 was the most important text ever written by Marx and that the conception of alienation that was there was the most relevant one. I believe that this interpretation, as I just said, is wrong. But also the second party, that is the party of uh, Althusser, that is the party of the Institute in Moscow, and uh, many other people that were more or less closer to the dogmatic tradition of Marxism, they refused the Marx of 1844. And they even said that that Marx was not Marxism and that actually Marxism started in 1845 with the German ideology, with a book that now we know, as I just said, that did not exist. So there is a problem also in this other reading, the reading of the epistemological break, right? If you wanna use a very famous expression. And then in my division of these three families, of these three categories, there is a third one, which is the party of the continuity between the early writings and capital. And this is where I will collocate myself. I will go there if I have to decide in which of these three houses I am um, going to live. But in this party of the continuity, I have many problems with actually the majority of scholars who belong to this interpretation because I strongly believe that there is a huge difference between the analysis of 1844 and the analysis that started with the Grundrisse, the analysis of alienation. The analysis of alienation that you read in the Grundrisse, that you read in the theory of surplus values, in many other manuscripts, preparatory manuscripts of capital that today we can read thanks to the mega, and then this question of fetishism that was published in capital, well, this is a much stronger analysis. There is a much stronger understanding of the social economical issues in the society. And I'm done, Paul. I see that you want to intervene. And there is also political, there is also political experience that was done by Marx. So Marx is not only learning from these books, but he's also learning from these eight years that he spent in the international, mm -hmm. and he learned many things. So when he's Posing this question to himself, these are also questions that are related to the organization of the society. And that's why I've decided to dedicate the last part of this contribution to the question of the alienation and communism. Because I believe that there is a strong connection between this free society, the contours of this free society and Marx's ideas of post-capitalism. It's terrific. I feel like we're getting a view of this one figure, alienation, and how the streams of Marx's own development and reception and um, the reinvestment in Marx form whirlpools around this term. I, I'm a kind of cut to the chase kind of person sometimes, and I wonder if um, we can say a little more, what was alienation in the manuscripts? What was alienation in capital? Why do you think those other terms like fetish or objectification, reification are translations of it or take up some of its work? Maybe this is one of the parts of your presentation, which is true. Yes, and um, as I said before to Paul uh, uh, Reiter, I will just like to share if you agree, because I believe it's, it's uh, better for uh, uh, the students who are listening. Unless you tell me that I better read a couple of definitions, but um, let's see if this works. And I'm going to share my uh, uh, screen here. So hopefully you can, you can uh, see it. Can you confirm? Thanks. We see it very well. 
thanks. So I will go back to this question uh, later. Uh, so to something that is related to alienation in Marx where, because I said that uh, is not only or merely or the most important in 1844. So I would like to discuss with you where we see the alienation, but let's go to this question of the terminology. Uh, it is very complicated because if we go into the um, question of, um, I'm just seeing uh, Paul North now because I have to read from the, from my uh, um, uh, PowerPoint. But if we go into this uh, um, analysis, you know, the etymology of the word alienatio for Latin, et cetera, or the word that alienation was used, I don't know, in the tradition of political economy, like selling, et cetera, this will take a lot of time, right? So I'm not going to do this. But I, will, I wanted to say something about Hegel, because Hegel is, of course, very relevant for Marx, in particular, and not only for this Marx of 1844. So the students who are um, uh, listening to us and now they are reading this, they see that I am uh, uh, referencing to the phenomenology of the spirit, which Hegel published in 1807, wrote in 1807. If you want to wrote, if you want to know what is the phenomenology of spirit for Marx, you have to know two things. Number one is something very wonderful and fascinating, and Marx had such a big respect for this work. But number two, Marx said many times in a couple of letters, this is worse than going to the dentist, okay? Something like this. If you wanna read it, if you wanna understand, uh, it's um, extremely difficult. So in this book, you find this terminology, entäußerung, which is literally self-externalization or actually renunciation, and enfremdung, estrangement. And Hegel is talking about the spirit becoming other than itself in the realm of objectivity. I am actually more familiar with the debate about uh, how to translate alienation in uh, Italian, Spanish, etc. And my English, not only my thick accent, is not the best, but um, we will discuss later. And I will be learned from, from Paul Reiter and uh, we will, uh, um, I mean, you decide if we want to discuss this more. What is important for Marx is the category of alienated labor, okay? That is enfremdet Arbeit, which is what you find more often in the EPM of 1844. So Marx is here um, expanding the problematic of alienation, okay? So the problematic of alienation is not only related to philosophy, to religion. When I say religion, you have to consider that Marx was part of this group, the left Hegelian, and they were trying to criticize Hegel. And there is this famous philosopher, Ludwig Feuerbach, he's writing about religion. So this is the beginning of the tradition of materialism. But what is beautiful, really unique, wonderful about this manuscript um, is the fact that there is a mix of philosophy and economics. Um, sometimes, uh, Paul North, I can only see you, but uh, Raymond Aron, the conservative uh, uh, French sociologist, he was making fun of all this um, um, leftists in the 60s in Paris uh, reading the EPM of 1844. There are very brilliant quotations and uh, you know this is the kind of text uh, it was said that you use when you want to impress uh, you know your boyfriend, your girlfriend, when you want to play the part of the intellectual, right? Full of this wonderful quotation, Hegel, Smith, etc. It is when Marx actually fall in love with political economy because Marx read The Political Economist in October 1843 for the first time. And by the way, thanks to Engels, because it was Engels who was before Marx traveling to England, looking at the contradiction of capitalism and then reading the classics. In any case, uh, alienation is presented as the phenomenon through which the labor product confront labor and here is the quotation, is something alien, is a power independent of the producer from the producer. So for Marx, alienation and toys rule of the worker in his product means not only that his labor becomes an object, an external existence, 
but that it exists outside him independently and something alien to him and that it becomes a power and is on confronting him. It means that the life which he had conferred on the object confronts him, her, as something hostile and alien. I don't want to make this extremely boring, okay? But uh, there are four ways in which Marx defined alienation in the economical philosophical manuscript. And there is a lot of attention that has been paid to this question of um, uh, immaterial alienation. So not only alienation as the process in the factory of the workers, etc., but also that you are alienated from your space of being, right? from other humans. There is, in my opinion, too much of this in many philosophical and uh, interpretation in psychology. We can discuss about this later if you want, or when we open the floor to questions. As I was saying before, alienation in the Grundrisse and other preparatory manuscripts, I cannot do quotations here because it would be too long, but I would like to take two more minutes to show you where I find many alienation in Marx. So here is enriched by a greater understanding of economic categories because Marx had just started. Marx was not even reading Ricardo and Smith in English since we are discussing translation a lot here. He was reading them through French translation and he go, goes back to them in English only later in the 50s when he's doing the famous Londoner notebooks. And there is also a more rigorous social analysis I was saying before, perhaps I would say social and also political analysis. So um, this book written by Lukas, History and Class Consciousness was very important as was very relevant. Another book written by Rubin about fetishism, this um, political economist, because these two scholars even do the mode right, of alienation hadn't started yet. This big model I tried to discuss at the beginning with Paul North when we say that the 60s and the 70s writing of alienation was almost a must if you were uh, in the department of philosophy or political science. Without this, Georgi Lukas in 1923, he introduced another term which is very relevant for Marxist tradition the term of reification, verdinglichung, versachlichung, sake is the thing, right? So this is the term to describe the phenomenon whereby labor activities confront human beings as something objective and independent, dominating them through external autonomous law. This is interesting, this is, uh, um, you know, remarkable, but something that many people don't know is that Lukacs was actually used later by those scholars and um, um, uh, professors, intellectuals that I mentioned be before, those who believe that alienation in 1844 is the most relevant conception of alienation made by Marx. It was used by them because in this book written in 1923, Lukács is still sharing the idea of Hegel that every objectification has alienation. It means that every society, it doesn't matter if there is a, a mode of production that is a capitalist mode of production or is a collective socialist mode of production, you will have alienation there. So Lukács is very angry where they are translating this book in the 60s in French and is also writing a special new preface for history and class consciousness. And he's saying, I was too Hegelian at the time. Now I change my position. We can go back to this later. And also I want to dedicate one minute to this question of the alienation in so-called actually existing socialism in the final part of my presentation. Here is what uh, Paul uh, Reiter told us uh, before. So the fetishism of commodity and its secrets, this is the um, this section in uh, volume one of Capital, where Marx showed that in capitalist society, people are dominated by the product they have created. Here, the relation among them appear not as direct social relation, 
between person and social, uh, sorry, um, social relation between person, but rather as material relation between person and social relation between things. So fetishism is the name given to the attribution to things, commodities of what are in fact social relations. So let's say that there is an inversion process that affects people in the capitalist system. And this is similar to the phenomenon of religious fetishism. There is a normal social relation and they are replaced by relation between things. This is what Marx wants to say here. Not opening the big discussion about fetishism in religion and the contribution of Marcel Mauss in 1907 after you know, criticizing what De Bros wrote about fetishism, which, is, which was a book that Marx read when he was very, very young at the time of the university. I'm skipping- Marcello, can I ask you a question in, in the middle? Yes, you can. I just want to say that I'm skipping this part but this is the famous definition that uh, uh, Paul was uh, uh, you know, uh, rephrasing in a very brilliant way before and that um, we know. So now I stop sharing my screen and uh, I'm back. Please confirm that you can see me. We see you. Thank you. Please. This is a quick question, but it's really what's most on my mind. I feel like the danger of the word alienation in existentialism in other discourses is that it be taken as a psychological state, a mood, an affect uh, with which to see the world or live your life that colors the way things are. It seems to me that um, you're saying as you line it up with fetishism and objectification that it isn't a mood, that it isn't something an individual feels. And in a sense, this is what Hegel said it's a part of a process of constructing the self in which the self confirms that there's something other than it by separating itself from itself. Mm -hmm. But what do you think the, the non-psychological reading of alienation is for Marx in Capital? Where does it hit us? Is it a matter of power and control? Is it, are we supposed to think about how we, um, uh, react to a certain situation or is it a structural issue? Thanks. Uh, any uh, remarks, a question or criticism from Paul, a uh, writer, or can I go ahead with this one and then there is more later? Uh, my dogs are barking right now, so I'm gonna leave it at that. Thanks. Um, it was nice. Um, yes. There is a, a period in which um, we had something that might be called the sort of irresistible fascination of the theory of alienation. It was the age of alienation to cool, right? It was uh, a real vogue and uh, alienation, just to um, read uh, a quotation from uh, this article that I share with you, from various political background and academic disciplines, they identified um, alienation, the causes of alienation as commodification, over-specialization, anomie, bureaucratization, conformism, consumerism, loss of a sense of self-aimed new technologies, personal isolation, apathy, social or ethnical margination, environmental pollution. So really this word alienation didn't mean anything in the end. And I also want to add one more point before trying to answer to the very uh, short but extremely difficult uh, question that uh, Paul made, that also in sociology, alienation completely changed uh, the meaning. Uh, perhaps not in the sense of looking at uh, the individual, but in the sense that alienation became something positive, okay? So for Marx, alienation is clear, is always a negative phenomenon that we have to try to uh, fight, okay? Not to overcome forever with just a revolution. I will go back to this point later but trying to make it smaller, less, and Marx is also suggesting something, at least I will try to provide some ideas in the final part of the talk. 
in sociology, on the contrary, in North American mainstream sociology, they treated alienation as a positive thing. And the question of how you look at this concept, this is completely different for Marx. It is always the question of the individual. I'm saying this not because I'm trying to borrow time from the question of Paul, but because actually I'm trying to answer to this question in a perhaps uh, 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 more difficult way. So the individual is the center, for me means that the individual must conform, must change. So it is not the question of social relations of the society that must change. It is a question of adaptation of the individual. It is a question that uh, you are not looking for solution, um, general changes, but you're looking for solution of the individual, of their capacity to adjust, their capacity to accept the existing order and uh, you know, the, the practice of our society. Now, why Marx is writing about this and what is the understanding of Marx? What is the, 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 the um, meaning of what he's doing? Well, first of all, I would say that in Capital is doing this because he wants to understand the society. So this concept is useful for us. Uh, like many other concepts that you will uh, um, discuss in this extremely brilliant and wonderful seminar that you organize, like for example, the question of money, right? That it's so relevant for our life, but it's so difficult to define and to understand. And this one too, how is it possible that our relations is not a direct relation, but actually we interact with each other through these commodities, through these things. So Marx is trying to understand the society, is trying to describe the society, and is also using this uh, um, uh, religious, uh, uh, as he wrote here, um, I call this fetishism, which attach itself to the product of labor as soon as they are produced as commodity and is therefore inseparable from the production of commodities. So uh, it is not, um, the, uh, here it is the quotation. And you know, in order to find an analogy, we must take flight into the misty realm of religion. And uh, this is what I wanted to uh, mention before. But there is one point that is very relevant for me. And here you have a very political reading of uh, Marx's conception of alienation. I don't know if you agree with this, but the difference between these pages of Marx, when he wrote for himself, as I will tell you later, or when he wrote uh, for an audience because he wanted to publish, because he published the book that uh, um, he was writing, like in the case of Capital, Grundrisse is a manuscript that he wrote for himself. Well, I read in these pages a theory that is a theory to understand the society, but also a theory to shake the society, to change the society. So not only a coherent theoretic, theoretical basis for in understanding capitalism and alienation, but also an anti-capitalist ideological platform. Like when I write in this article, um, alienation left the books of the philosopher. Alienation is no longer a debate, even though brilliant and fascinating that this young uh, uh, progressive left Hegelian were having in Berlin after Engel, uh, Hegel died. So it's not something that takes place only in the lecture hall of university, but it's something that must go to the street, must go to social movements, to trade unions, to political parties. And in my opinion, this is also why this concept had such a strong fortune, at least in, I always think with my European eyes, right? I see with my European eyes in the 60s, in the 70s, because there was a fantastic, political and social movement that exploded in those years. And these books of Marx, even though they were written in such a difficult and complicated way, Paul Reiter is lucky because he's retranslating Capital Volume 1 and not the Grundrisse. That would be perhaps even more complicated. I don't know, I'm just also joking. But even though Grundrisse is so difficult, they could see that their 
that uh, interpretation of Marx, those ideas of Marx are also something that belong to their life, are useful for their life. And this is why they were so um, used and you know, circulated the world for many decades. That's terrific. I think now we've set the stage for de-alienation and hopefully what comes after it or what might come after it, communism. Would you like to jump to that part? Yes. Um, can I be um, uh, so impolite to take one more minute and to go back to something in my PowerPoint that uh, I think is useful for uh, um, the youngest... Um, 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 can you see my PowerPoint here? Uh, thanks. Um, to the students who are here. Um, this is something that I've been uh, editing. It's an anthology. Um, I don't want to do advertisement, but um, it's a book that will come out in December. And um, I would like to tell you the work that I've done in putting together this anthology. Um, so alienation in Marx where? Okay, this is my question. I wanted to um, re-establish the relevance of uh, uh, economic writings and of this uh, um, better major understanding of capitalism. I don't like to use young major this word, but you know, at least we understand each other by saving time. Uh, I believe that we must concentrate our attention when we talk about alienation in Marx on the most relevant pages of Marx's later economic writings. So not only the economical philosophical writings of 1844. And uh, I had to divide the book in three parts for um, editorial reasons. Uh, this is my research that I want to share with you. Uh, hopefully it's not too boring, but I want to try to explain this. So when we look at this early philosophical writings or to uh, you know, what Marx wrote in the 50s, right? Um, there is not very much about alienation after the um, 1844. So this note on James Mill, they were written at the same time of the Economical Philosophical Manuscript. For me, actually, they belong to the Economical Philosophical Manuscript because Marx is just writing these things for himself. And there is a lot of, uh, about alienation that he is writing because he is um, stimulated by this book, Elements of Political Economy. After this, after this big uh, um, analysis and putting together philosophy with um, uh, political economy, the concept disappears. There are just few references in uh, the Holy Family, the German ideology, but actually this is something that is uh, <coughs> uh, very um, small. And Marx is, sorry, not very small. Uh, it's something that Marx is very critical of this. It's very critical because uh, Marx is now speaking to an audience that is no longer the audience of this uh, brilliant but very few uh, philosophers in Berlin. Now Marx is in the political fight. He is an activist in Paris. He was uh, expulsed from uh, France, from Belgium, then he goes back to France in 1848. Who will talk to workers and who will tell them you are uh, alienated, you are estranged, you are uh, reificated, there is a fetishism, even though Marx didn't know, uh, didn't use this expression at the time with relation to political economy. Look what happened here. So when Marx is starting to write uh, Capital, the first so-called draft of Capital, the Grundrisse, the outlines of the critique of political economy, I found 11,000 words, so I found a lot, because this is what Marx is writing for himself. So when we talk about Marx, I'm sorry that you cannot see me, Paul, you tell me if I have to put the PowerPoint down or if more useful to show you this, but uh, I will try to stop share and then I will come back so you can see me. It is very relevant for us to understand that there is a difference between what Marx wrote to publish, Capital, and then there is the problem of what Marx wanted to change because Marx changed Capital Volume 1 in a couple of occasions and he would have done even more. So not only you have to know what is the difference between what Marx wrote 
a very few uh, project compared to the many projects that he had were completed by Marx and they were published. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know, we can count them. Then there are the manuscript that Marx wrote for himself, like for example, the Grundrisse, self-clarification, self-verständigung, or preparatory writings that Marx is drafting and not is not satisfied and move forward and forward. Then there is journalism, then there is the correspondence with other people, which was essential for the um, you know, political propaganda, and then the very relevant uh, manuscript notebooks in which Marx um, was uh, uh, studying and was taking notes. So when Marx is writing the second category of uh, writings that I just mentioned now, the manuscript, preparatory manuscript, you will find a lot. This text, number eight, this is called the Ur text. So this is the preparatory text for the first book of political economy that Marx published in 1859, Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy. So you see that there is not very much there. But look, Marx is writing about alienation extensively, not only in the Grundrisse, but also in um, a draft that is um, only partially translated into English, that in the Mega is called Manuscript 1861-1863. The Mega is the German edition, historical critical edition. And then in the Tier of Surplus Value that Marx wrote between 62 and 63, there is a lot. So I learn a lot when I read this text. I understand alienation, but actually more than understanding alienation, I understand capitalism much better than when I read the text of 1844. And then the final part here, capital, you know, this is really when Marx is writing capital. So these are not manuscript written for himself. This is uh, very important for us, the so-called unpublished chapter six. Marx is returning on this question with very brilliant, beautiful way. These are all the places where you find the uh, ideas that capital is vampire and is taking the blood of uh, living labor, etc. And then this is what Paul Reiter mentioned at the beginning, the famous uh, section uh, of um, volume one. And there is also chapter uh, capital volume three. Okay, so there is a lot of capital that um, is uh, uh, a lot of alienation that you find. Um, and uh, the part that you find in the early writings is a, a very minoritarian and perhaps not even the most uh, important one. Thank you, Marcello. This is such a gift to have all of this laid out for us. I feel like we should open up to everyone's questions. They've been thinking this through with you very soon. I'm not sure if you want to give an abbreviated version of the how to de-alienate and is this a how-to? Do we have a recipe for de-alienating? I would like to leave the recipe for the end in case somebody is asking for a recipe. Let's see, let's see what happens, right? Because it's possible the discussion will go there. But um, Perfect. I mean, yeah. That's and great. I'll ask you, Paul, if it's possible that I uh, answer to two, three questions together, not one by one, so that we Perfect. give more chances to answer to more questions. I might be able to combine them if, if I can. Okay, thank you very much. This would be a moment in which there would be thunderous applause if we were in a fleshy setting. So we can all thank you for this. It represents many years of work and a, and a, a couple of decades of working through Marx. So and you said that the, the volume on alienation, this anthology is gonna be out in December? Yes, it's going to be published on December the 8th by- December the 8th, excellent. Well, congratulations like on that. What I'd like to do is ask for questions from the students in the seminar. This is not a um, two-tiered system, but they're young and they're just working through marks. So I want to give them kind of first opportunity to articulate their questions. And then we will turn to anybody and everybody who's here who has questions. So if the students would put their questions in the chat, then we will try to unmute the asker and have them ask their question. And we'll do a couple of them as Marcello asks. Uh, 
I'm willing don't make to... me take away from your grade students if you don't ask questions. That's all right, I'm not gonna do that. Maybe we'll take some time for them to. Uh, I see there ask. are many, many, many questions here, many uh, interventions, but um, um, we are starting with the student, as you say. Oh, let's start with Ali. Could, um, Audrey, if you're there, would you unmute Ali? Yep, she, they are unmuted. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your lecture. I think it was really insightful. My question refers to the initial remarks that you had about the revival of Marxist reading following the 2008 crisis and especially the political revival in Latin America. I wonder what you make of the revival in Trotskyist mobilization as well, significantly in Argentina. Do you think it's a reaction to the failed Bolshevik cause or is it a sign of certain kind of yearning for an internationalist approach, a symptom of a methodological vacuum that we face right now, or more as a general question, can revolution be alienated on its ideological grounds as well, just like the labor? I don't know if it was if that was clear, but yeah, you said question. can can revolution be alienated, right? Yes. Or as the revolution and in its imagined forms. Thank you. Muted. Maybe we'll take a couple of the other questions that are in here. Can we go back to Liz Kinaman or Kinaman? And would someone unmute her and ask her to read her question? This is complicated to do, but I prefer to hear everyone's voice or see their face when they're asking. I think that's. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so I actually made a comment which um, and a question. So the question was, Marcello, are you saying that the concept of alienation as it appeared in the 1844 manuscripts, that it kind of fractured into multiple different, more precise concepts like mystification or, com uh, or commodity fetishism? Is that is that kind of your argument about what happens to alienation um, as it as it goes on? Thank you. And uh, the remark, and also, can you repeat your name, please? Uh, my name is Liz Kinnaman. Liz, right? Liz? Liz. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's go from there to one more. Um, we are already moved out of the realm of the students who obviously all fail. Um, but that's okay. You're thinking people. The students in this course are really putting their best brain cells into this. So it, it is true that it takes some time. Um, could we open up the voice and picture of Baruch Jimenez Contreras, who has comments and questions? Uh, hi, uh, I am interested in the concept of alienation and I have a little paper in a scholar journal about it. And I identify that before uh, the manuscript of, of 1844, there are another um, perspective of alienation in economic uh, history of ideas, uh, and specifically in Adam Smith. Uh, what, why do you think uh, that Mark does not refer to these discoveries in his work? It's it's all. Thank you, Marcello. I, I had problem in understanding. Would you be so kind to repeat, please? Baruch, eh. si lo okay. quieres decir en español, yo te traduzco. Ah, bueno, okay. yo puedo entender en español también. No, no, bueno, no. dale. Eh, ¿Por qué consideras que que Armand no no identificó el fenómeno de la alienación que presenta Adam Smith? in the book, Quinto de la Riqueza de las Naciones. 
¿Por qué, él, ¿Por qué él no analizó Smith? ¿Por qué él no analizó el concepto de alienación de, en el libro de Smith? Ajá. Gracias. Ok, Marcello, this is three. Do you want to go ahead and respond? Uh, I'll take one more if you can, but if there are no other questions, I will, okay. I'm, ready to, I'm ready to answer. We have a, a student showing up. Can we unmute Lawrence Liu, please? Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm in the midst of an eating an orange. Um, I, yeah, I, I was really surprised by um, your comments at the beginning when you were discussing like the sort of different national revivals of Marx readings. And you said that sort of Chinese students ended up, um, and by that I mean students in China ended up focusing on certain issues and not others. And it made me think of um, the sort of Communist Party's push right now for what they call like socialism with Chinese characteristics and um, the sort of increasing pressure that, you know, um, that's being reported on, on on academics to sort of shore up China's sort of brand of development, like state and private development, right? Um, and sort of an emergence of a new intellectual class of like Chinese political theorists who are trying to like justify like Xi Jinping's rule. Um, and, and so I, I was just wondering how you see the relationship between Chinese politics today and the sort of new, the new sorts of readings of Marx that are coming out. Okay, Marcello, you're on. Uh, you know the name of the last uh, student, Lawrence, right? Lawrence, Lawrence. Now I can see it. Uh, was nice to see Lawrence because I can see also his, um, his face. Um, so there are four questions and um, as I suspected, and as I said to Paul North and Paul uh, Reiter, there is a lot of interest for the Marx revival. So I'm um, happy to, to hear about this. I will start from uh, this um, um, uh, two uh, questions, the last Lawrence and the first Ali, because in my opinion, they are uh, um, connected. So Lawrence, I, have, uh, as I'm sure that you have, uh, have understood from my presentation, uh, I don't share this um, reading of uh, Marx, you know, the Marxist-Leninist uh, tradition, Brezhnev in Soviet Union, imaging China uh, today. So I'm not saying that, um, uh, um, you know, like some other scholars that, you know, Marx ideas are reviving in China, etc. What I was trying to say is that I was uh, um, glad to see, and I look at this phenomenon with a lot of interest, that in some of the main universities that I visited, the University of Nanjing, where I work as a visiting professor, Fudan University in Shanghai, even in Beijing, even though I'm a little bit more complicated, I saw many people engaged in translating and bringing new readings not only of Marx, Marxist tradition and also, you know, philosophy, for example, other authors into Chinese. And uh, what I said, perhaps I was talking too fast or with my poor English, that I was looking at this in a positive way. Like I was looking at this as the possibility to interact with a new generation of uh, students, of scholars. Also trying to listen what they do. It took me some time, but I found very interesting partners, and now they're writing articles and books and chapters that I help to publish or include in my edited volumes or in the journal I collaborate with or in my series. I think this is very good. So I went to that university in Nanjing, and I saw, for example, that they have an institute where they translate uh, uh, Friedrich Jameson, right? And I was surprised. There is a lot of uh, interest for that. Recently, there were some problems because also some of these authors that are translated, sometimes they sign petition against, uh, you know, oppressive uh, political decision of the regime. And that's why there were also cuts in the, in the last uh, year and a half, two years. But I was just mentioning the fact that um, it is, uh, um, uh, good that this is possible now. And I see that the students in China are also very 
hungry, thirsty, they want to read, they want to learn, they want to interact. So this is uh, uh, good. To Ali, I want to talk about Argentina and my experiences in Argentina. There were two uh, conferences in 2018 in, in Argentina. One was the bicentenary uh, of Marx. So they were doing this kind of big conference and uh, they were able to get, there was a very conservative government at the time, one of the most conservative in, uh, in, in, in South America. They got in the end the, the, big, uh, um, the, 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 the biggest hall, the biggest venue, which was the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the museum, the hall of the library, the hall of the museum, I don't remember the name now. And uh, they were expecting a very big success. They were expecting 500 people there. When the organizer, you know, were walking that morning and they came out from the subway and look at the number of people who were in line, they could not believe it. There were thousands of people and most of them were young people, many young women, many young students. They were there because they wanted to learn about Marx and they didn't even have a, an uh, impressive international program with big names like Nancy Fraser, David Harvey. They were just there because of Marx. They were just there because it was a curiosity of Marx. Myself, I went to Argentina the same year for uh, an event, and Paul, you allow me if I can be a little bit biographical and make it a little bit lighter at this point of the conversation. The same year, there was the CLACSO. They have the conference. CLACSO is the Organization for Social Science in the um, Latin America and the Caribbean, and uh, it's about many things, many topics. Um, there are generally 40,000 people who attend this event just coming from outside the organizing country. I was one of the guests in the um, lecture about Marx. There were two other guests. One is uh, Cinzia Ruzza that uh, you are inviting here in a few weeks, and the other one is um, a Swedish uh, uh, um, um, professor um, who was a sociologist at um, Cambridge and his name is Goran Terborg. And uh, the three of us were actually impressed because we were hostages in a very big room which was packed like in a way that I never seen before. And uh, I was surprised to see that that room was for Marx. It was not from uh, Diego Perotti, one of my favorite Argentinian actors, who was giving a presentation in the room after. So I went to the other presentation, but I realized that Marx was the place with more people waiting on the line outside. So this is the kind of enthusiasm that Marx is creating in some parts of the world. There are parts of the world where you cannot mention the name of Marx. And one of the geographical areas where there are more problems is, for example, Eastern Europe, because they associate Marx to that kind of communism, okay? So you will not see there. Like for example, Marx has not been read in North Korea for at least the last 30 years by anybody, even though they say Marxism is what you see in North Korea. So the party in Argentina, which is a party that I know very well, comes from this Trotskyist tradition, was the organization that existed in Argentina was the most structured one and they were very successful in responding to this demand. Huh? So, you know, they entered in parliament, they elected uh, many members of parliament, they are active, they give a, a good contribution. And if I may say one more thing, the most beautiful thing that I've seen in Argentina is this uh, social movement about the question of uh, feminism, this new generation of activism. And they are also trying to interrogate Marx. I think that Marx would have to learn a lot from them if he was alive, but that kind of um, approach that they have, that kind of uh, look at the society, I found it very close to many things that Marx wrote. I see that Paul wants to intervene. No, just a small comment. I worry that with so many people going to conferences on Marx's works that they'll miss the revolution if it actually happens. <laughs> You have a couple more there, and we have two more. I'm just conscious of people's time, so you have two more questions to respond to maybe, and then we'll take two more that are um, in the chat. That's a possibility. In any case, I am uh, very happy to stay here for all the questions and to respond to all the students, but I don't want to force my 
chair to be there for the end of the night. So you decide. Uh, Baruch, Marx didn't analyze Smith because as I mentioned at the beginning, and surely I was not clear, the concept of alienation that you see in Smith, the problematic that you see in the wealth of nation is very different from the way Marx is using that word. So the word alienation is something that is more about selling, if I understand your question correctly. Why Marx is using alienation as one of the main category in order to explain to workers, because capital was written for workers, how crazy our society is, how inverted are our relations, our social relations in capitalist mode of production. And Liz, the last question, the second, um, it was a very good one. Yes, I think uh, it, it, this is the most difficult question so far, even more than one that Paul asked me uh, at the beginning, and I don't have enough time to discuss this, but Liz is asking, are you saying that what we read in 1844 is fractured in more concept later? Well, I would say that um, what uh, that definition of alienation is illustrating, is illustrating for the point of view of human relations, the worker in the factory, the worker with the other worker, the worker with himself or in the relationship with the object in the division of labor, then there is a, a concept of alienation, which is what we discussed before, um, thanks to what uh, Paul uh, uh, Reiter said, fetishism, that is a concept that is alienation in relation to the commodity, okay? So I don't have time to say exactly fractured, etc., but they are different angles. One is the angles of the human relation and the other one is the angle of the commodity. Then there is the big question of the society. And perhaps if I have time, I will go back to, to something that I prepared. But let's see what are the other questions and where we are going. Terrific. I'm going to, there are two that seem to lead from one to the other. So I'm going to read for Felix Buchwald, whose microphone is not working, his question in the chat, the commodity fetishism is generally seen as a defining characteristic of the capitalist mode of production. However, Marx's discussion of the commodity fetishism in capital precedes his shift from exchange to production and the introduction of the class relation between capital and labor. What do you make of the argument of George Henderson and others that the commodity fetishism is consequently applicable beyond capitalism due to its basis in exchange and not production? A technical question. But, and then if you want to, uh, Alexander Kolokotranis, uh, pardon my horrible pronunciation, um, asks, does Marx see de-alienation as something that can be total? Is it a constant process? And that gives you a chance to tell us what, what you think that is. Yeah. Uh, I would like to share my uh, email address. I don't know if it ap appeared on the on the, um, the the presentation of the lecture. In any case, it's my website is my name and my surname marcellomusto.org, and uh, people, students can write me. Hopefully, I'm not going to get uh, uh, 15, 20 emails, but I would be very happy to discuss this uh, uh, question that uh, Felix is asking me, Paul, help me. I don't know how I can do this without, uh, uh, I don't know, taking 10, 15 minutes and saying goodbye to the end of the, of the conversation. So I hope that Felix is not um, uh, angry at me if I will be in touch with him separately, because this is related to, you know, very specific things and interpretation and argument and author. And uh, I might also provide a couple of readings. And uh, this Can is I ask you though, along that line, do you have just a quick answer to the question, um, is there non-alienated labor or is there non-alienated non -alienated sociality? Uh, that's, you know, one of the most interesting points for me. And I will try to argue, uh, uh, to answer to this one in connection with uh, um, the other question. Just please, Paul, ask, help me. Your question is, how much does the alienated really on fantasism, subjectivity, wholeness, that one? That's one of them, yes. Yeah. And then there's um, Alexander's. Alex, because I see Alexander there. Um, 
Stay where is the other one? Okay, Alexander. Does Mark see the alienation as something that can be total or the alienation as a constant process? Good, so I will try to discuss these things. There is um, a very nice quotation from uh, um, Henri Lefebvre, and he's talking about the fact that at some point um, in Soviet Union, they did not want to hear the question alienation. They did not want to discuss alienation because they were responding simply like we have socialism therefore we no longer have alienation so alienation could and must no longer be an issue for them i had the same kind of answer in uh, in china and i had a couple of uh, brilliant professors who were hosting me the conversation went to uh, social work and the making of this new department of social work by the way very mainstream and American approach to social work. And there is nothing of political in their social work. Social work in Brazil is uh, one of the most progressive disciplines. And it was also essential, the contribution that they had in uh, formating uh, people, militant activists against the dict uh, dictatorship. So they said, why do you want social work? We have socialism, right? So there was this idea that socialism is the end of the contradiction. You find this kind of approaches also in uh, uh, authors from, uh, from Europe, so-called Western authors. For example, uh, Lucien Goldman. Lucien Goldman wrote about this and he said that it is possible to overcome alienation, definitely overcome alienation in the social economic condition of the time. And he's actually writing that Alienation, I'm reading the quotation here from his uh, Dialectical Research 1959, very important moment for the alienation debate, is in fact a phenomenon closely bound up with the absence of planning and with production for the market. He said that Soviet socialism in the East and Keynesian policies in the West were resulting in the first case, elimination of reification. And in the second case, in a progressive weakening of alienation. Well, I believe that history has demonstrated the faultiness of these predictions, right? And this is not the position of Marx, even though Marx has been read and described by this, you know, teleology and this position, end of history, et cetera, which is something that you find in Marx. There are three, four passages in which he's writing in that way. But um, sometimes these are political passages where you have to be careful what text are you reading. Sometimes is also uh, the fact that, you know, Marx wrote thousands of pages and so you can find many things. Sometimes because Marx was wrong, right? So there are different uh, answers and options to this. But his ideas is not that you do the revolution, you put a red star at the top of a building and there is no longer alienation in that society. And actually, this uh, actually existing uh, socialism society, they proved to go in the opposite direction. Like for example, when the workers in uh, Berlin, in the so-called East Berlin, they were struggling against one of the first measures that were taken by the government, which was not the reduction of the working day, but it was the increase of the working day. So you do find this kind of things. I would like to share once again the PowerPoint if I am allowed. And uh, I would like to say what Marx wrote about this. I don't know if at some point we can make this uh, PowerPoint uh, available. <clears throat> um, um, you can read this one. So I believe that the question of the alienation, the writing of alienation are useful for the research that, you know, the. Um, that Marx did on communist society, the description of post-capitalist society. And I had prepared this question that are essential question for Marx. I can only list them, Paul, don't be worried, just 30 more seconds, very quickly. The essential topic for Marx, uh, you know, a de-alienated society, a communist society, as a society in which there is association of free human beings, full and free development of every individual. This is what Marx is looking at. Marx is also talking about social character of the production. So I want to make this clear because I don't want to be 
misunderstood. I'm answering to the question. I'm trying to answer to the question. I'm trying to list essential elements in an organization or a society, political, economical, or social element that for Marx will make a significant difference compared to capitalism. This does not mean for Marx that this is the end of alienation. But this means that once society is introducing these elements, there is an improvement and uh, there are less chances for uh, you know, workers to live in uh, the terrible condition that we experience under capitalism. This question of the social character of the production is one of them. Because Marx said that in socialism, in what he called the associate mode of production, you see this general product from the beginning, not only in the end, after the chaos of the market and of the capitalist production. There is a lot about planned cooperation, okay? Marx is talking about this in volume one. I'm sure that you will go back to this with other um, guests in the coming weeks. Marx is talking about reckon in advance how much labor, how many means of production and means of subsistence, subsistence can be spent, etc. I have no time. But surely the idea of Marx is to contrasting this free competition, this idea of freedom of individualism that is into capitalism. Marx is in favor of the individual. Marx consider the individual as an essential element to alienate, uh, de-alienate the society so that the individual has space to produce, to think, to interact freely. But his conception of uh, freedom is different from, from uh, those of uh, capitalists. Individuals are subsumed under social production in capitalism, wage labor, okay? So for Marx, the essential question is the change of the production and not only on the distribution. The society will be much less, significantly less alienated if there is a change in the production. And I provided some uh, definition in the article on uh, communism that is, has been recently published in the Marx Revival that Paul North was so kind to cite at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, time and reduction of the working day is another essential element, Alexander, of the de-alienation, um, uh, right? So the society should go in that direction, the direction that labor is liberated, is free, not for the capitalists to ex exploit us more, so, but for us to live in a better, have a better life, you know, to be educated. And, you know, there is ownership of the means of production for Marx means change the lifetime of society. And this is what we are talking when we talk about the alienation. It's not a philosophical formula. So, Non-alienated society is free development. I don't have time to talk about this, but there is this famous quotation of volume three of Capital when Marx is talking about the realm of freedom. And I think uh, you really could talk about this if you want to, Marcello. We have 10 minutes in the allotted time and oh, okay. it's like a, a I was, great- I was uh, worried and uh, you know, I cannot see how many questions are, uh, are there. There so, are a lot of questions and very good ones. We might not get to all of them we'll try to save them and send them to you but but this seems like an important topic um thanks i was just trying to drink um a little bit so i'm going to spend um just two minutes about this i want to return on this question which is um still creating problems in my opinion in many contemporary political readings of marx so what is freedom for Marx? Marx wrote about this. I find a lot of this in the preparatory manuscript and sometimes also in the letter, even though there are other treasures in the notebooks, in the excerpts, that is what I use for the analysis of the last Marx, but this will be the topic of another conversation that we will have in the future. So if we focus on non-alienated society, so Marx is writing about this question of individual freedom. Living in a non-alienated society meant building a social organization in which a fundamental value was given to individual freedom. This is me writing. Now I'm going to quote from the Grundrisse because Marx in the Grundrisse, and not only there, there are several manuscripts in the late 50s 
in which Marx is very angry about the foolishness of those socialists. Marx here is thinking about French socialists in particular and his contemporaries, like Alain Proudhon, not uh, Saint-Simon and Fourier. Marx had a tremendous respect for them, like for Robert Owen. This French socialist contemporary to Marx, the false brother of socialism, Marx called them in the Grundrisse, they want to depict socialism as the realization of the ideals of bourgeois society articulated by the French Revolution, who demonstrated that exchange and exchange value, etc., were good at the beginning, okay? But they were perverted later by capital. It is just a question of capital. It's just a question of distribution. These are so important political questions. The International is debating about this a lot. The difference between Marx and Proudhon is not about misery of philosophy, poverty of philosophy, philosophy of poverty. This is uh, 1847 polemics. If you want to understand the difference between Marx and Proudhon, you have to go to this manuscript of the 50s, both of them, and then the political struggle that is happening in the international when there are two different conceptions about how to organize a non-alienated society. One is looking at distribution Proudhon, one is looking at the change of the production Marx. So Marx is writing in the Grundrisse, free development under the domination of capital was the most sweeping abolition of all individual freedom and the complete subjugation of individual to social condition, which assumed the form of objective powers, indeed of overpowering objects independent of the individuals relating to one another. You see that the concept is there, the idea is there and is developing this. Now, Capital Volume 3, which you know was written by Marx before Capital Volume 1, because the main draft belongs to 1865. So this is the famous quotation that I don't want to read, right? When Marx is talking about the realm of freedom, uh, um, is, uh, um, you know, I just cut this quotation here. I will just... Uh, call your attention on this uh, very, very short part, because generally it's quoted, it's uh, 500 words, it's one full page, no? The realm of freedom really begins only where labor determined by necessity and external um, uh, experience ends, okay? So um, freedom can consist only in this, that socialized human, the associated producer, governed human metabolism with nature in a rational way. By the way, there is so much ecological marks in this manuscript, preparatory manuscript of capital, as my colleague Kohei Saito has demonstrated recently after a lot of good scholarship on the topic and accomplishing it with the least expenditure of energy and in conditions most worthy and appropriate for their human nature. So this is the quotation in which alienation, the end of alienation, the real conception of freedom and the reduction of the working day is, uh, they are all together. So this is a very well-known alienation. I end by saying this, that this post-capitalist society of production, together with all the progress of technology, the reduction of the working day, they create the possibility, it's not guaranteed, it's not a necessity, it's never the end because the contradiction will start once again, but there is a possibility for a new social formation in which the coercive alienated labor imposed by capital, we are talking about wage labor, of course, and subject to its laws is gradually replaced with something that Marx called sometimes a conscious creative activity beyond necessity. And this is what Marx called as the real realm of freedom, the genuine realm of human freedom, which is very different from the realm of freedom for capital that we have in our society. You should see me, you should be able to see me if I'm not wrong. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> There's so much to say. We're just getting started. You're right that you need a, an all night seminar on alienation. 
I think what we should do is thank the people who came and asked questions. There are some still littering the chat, um, filling the chat that are really quite good. How would you conceptualize the relationship between alienation and abstract labor? There are questions about Michael Heinrich, an important question about Feuerbach and the development of the idea of species being, but I really do think we need to leave it here. No, no, so, I have a very good answer to this. And the answer is that you organize this seminar with 12 lectures and there is a lot of uh, room and uh, food for thought for the colleagues that will come after me. Huh? Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and all of this wonderful work.